In the heart of London's Science Museum, a special exhibition called Who Am I? looks at the features that have made humans the most successful species on the planet. It's a theme that resonates loudly with Mark Pagel, a star among a new breed of scientists who are using evolutionary biology to understand human culture and creativity. His book, Wired for Culture, published last year, explains how genes and culture evolved hand in hand through language and cooperative behavior to build our modern industrial society. I caught up with him at the Science Museum to hear what his work at Reading University's Evolution Laboratory says about the future of humanity at a time of unprecedented technological and social change. Mark Pagel, you've been applying evolutionary biology to our human culture, our language, our creativity, our innovation. And what sort of lessons are you learning? I think one of the things we learn about humans is that um, we're different from the other animals in ways that we take for granted, but have utterly transformed the world. So for example, we have technology that accumulates over time. We have a history. No other animal does. And this is something we just take for granted. And how has that arisen? I mean, it is such a fundamental discontinuity, yet the DNA, as people have told us many times, between, there's very little difference in the DNA between us and chimps or gorillas. I mean, how did that come about? Yes, that's right. I mean, there's almost no difference between us genetically and our closest relatives, like the Neanderthals or the, or the chimps, and yet there's this unbridgeable evolutionary gap between us and the other animals. And it all comes down to our ability to copy. I sometimes call it copying with a purpose. And it's something we take for granted, but other animals cannot do this. And what it allows us to do is watch what other humans are doing and copy the best ideas among them. And then those ideas can flow among societies and ideas can accumulate and allows us to tap into the wisdom of groups of people. There's a bit of copying in the animal kingdom, isn't there? There is. There's wonderful copying in the animal kingdom. And yet, what's funny about it is that, you know, we can teach a chimpanzee to drink tea from a cup. We can teach them to use a saw. We can teach them to sweep a floor. We can teach them to wash dishes. But before you think about hiring one around your house as a maid, realize that that chimp will just as happily wash a dirty dish as a clean one, <laughs> because they're not actually washing the dish to clean it. And that's the key difference. Uh, they're washing it to get a banana. And this is why the animals don't progress. They simply recreate every generation, the actions of the others around them. They're not inheriting that technology the way we do. And you'll be aware that we are surrounded by objects that others have created, that we have very little understanding of how they work or how they were built. And we inherit this as a sort of cultural genome. How did that happen, given that for most of human history. We were living in tiny groups. Yes, I mean, creativity turns out to be an extremely difficult thing. Um, innovation is hard, and most of us aren't very good at it. And so it turns out we rely on the skills and the talents and the wisdom in our group so that we can copy it. We can tap into all of that knowledge in the group. But what that means is that early in our history, when we lived in very small groups, there wasn't a whole lot of wisdom and knowledge and skills to tap into and some it was easily lost if somebody who had a lot of wisdom died their knowledge went with them mm. and so early in our history these small groups greatly slowed the rate at which we accumulated technology we were still accumulating it yes. but at a very very slow rate and when did it really take off do you think it seems to be the case if you look in the fossil record that it really took off sometime around 40,000 years ago or so and this might have been a time when we were living in groups of 150 maybe to 500 people, so larger perhaps than we were living, the groups we were living in 160 to 200,000 years ago. That seems to be a time of real explosion in cultural artifacts. And do you think the groups made contact with each other in a peaceful and creative way, or were they fighting? It was both. Our, our history as a species is one of living in these small cooperative societies that were often in direct competition with the group next door. And yet another unique feature of humans is that, again, we take it utterly for granted, but we've acquired the ability to negotiate and trade and exchange goods and services. And so throughout our history, it's been a constant sort of tension between how much you should exchange or trade with the group next door and whether you should simply vanquish them. 
And so indeed, we have been gaining the kind of technologies of other groups around us for probably 50, 60, 70,000 years. And what role does language play in all this? I know that's a particular interest of yours, the evolution of, of languages. Languages unite, languages fragment, don't they? Yes, they do. I mean, language is, is, is we, we probably have language because we've evolved this ability to copy others. As soon as I can copy your best ideas, in a sense, I'm stealing something from you. And so to resolve the tension that arises, to resolve the conflict that arises, we need some medium of exchange where we can negotiate. If I'm going to steal your best idea, perhaps I have to give something back. And if we look at what language is used for, a lot of language is about negotiating, planning, bargaining, you know, cooperating. Did the different groups share common language or was it, were the languages all very different from group to group? I know you've shown that modern tribes use language as a way of keeping themselves separate, a means of exclusivity, don't they? As well as a means of um, bargaining, exchanging, being open. That's right. I mean, there, there, there are places on earth where you will find a distinct tribal group every couple of miles, and that, that the, these distinct groups speak mutually incomprehensible languages. And so it seems to be the case that we're using our language to establish an identity and almost to draw a ring around our tribal group as if to say, these are the people that I cooperate with. These are the people who share my future. And the people next door who speak a different language are a different tribal group. And we even seem to actively change our language to distinguish ourselves from the group next door. There's, there's anecdotal evidence from anthropologists of tribal groups getting together and actively changing some of their words simply to distinguish themselves from the group next door. And one of the most amusing ones was a, a tribal group that one afternoon reversed their words for yes and no, <laughs> simply to distinguish themselves from the group next door. And you can imagine the confusion this would have caused if somebody had been away for the weekend and came home. Well, let's leap from that world, the 20th century world, to um, the 21st century world where English is becoming a global language, the internet is connecting everyone, we've got billions of people in contact indirectly or directly. How are we coping given our, our background? Yes, I mean if, if the background we're discussing is this one of sort of a, of a tension between cooperation and conflict, one of the wonderful things about human nature is that prosperity has always seemed to trump conflict. And so if we can gain more by cooperating than we can by sort of endless rounds of revenge and counter-revenge, we will cooperate. And so what we're seeing in this kind of new, globalized, hyper-connected world is that languages and cultures are gradually homogenizing. And of the, of the sort of 7,000 distinct human languages spoken on Earth, it's already the case that a mere 10 of them account for 50% of the world's speakers. And so we're already seeing a great loss of linguistic diversity as people adopt the majority and languages. And people mourn the loss of those languages, don't they? They try to keep them alive, possibly yeah. futile gesture. I don't know what you think. Well, people do. I mean, our, our language is so much a part of our identity that if you're a speaker of a minority language, it's not nice when the youngsters in your yeah. society are learning the majority language next door. I think most of these attempts are ultimately futile. Everyone mourns the loss of, of a language and the cultural sort of reference that it takes with it. But it's usually the case that it's the young people in a society that are voting with their mouths, you might yes. say, by actively adopting the language next door. Nobody's forcing them, compelling them to learn that language. Indeed, it's the minority languages that people have to be compelled to learn. And so I think they're fighting an ultimately losing battle against these majority languages. I, I think that if we wait long enough, it's nearly inevitable that one day there'll be a single language spoken on Earth. And that's likely to be some version of English. At the moment, it looks like it's English because I say there are 10 languages that account for 50% of the world's speakers. What's interesting about those 10 languages is that they are what's called bridging languages. If you speak Japanese and I speak French and we meet on the subway, we're likely to speak to each other in English. I have colleagues at the moment from Europe, Western European countries who say that when they're speaking in scientific language, they even speak to their native countrymen in English rather than their native language. Yes, and some of the multinational companies based in Europe have 
internal meetings in English when indeed. there are no English people present. Indeed, indeed. Um, and so this is the way that it's, it's, it's like a sort of sleeper cell almost. English is just worming its way into the consciousnesses of all of these people. And it's not something that we necessarily have to advocate or not take a stance on. It's merely happening. I and mean, it's happening empirically. And we, we know that. Let's move back to creativity. Creativity in the sense of cultural creativity, making things, new experiences, new products. Is our rate of creativity increasing because there are so many of us connected now and so many people can feed into this sort of process that you described as being an iterative, progressive process? Yes, I mean we talked about how small groups have a slow rate of the accumulation of technology and now in this sort of hyper-connected world, we see that the, the pace of technological change is almost something we can see on a week-to-week -week basis. And it leads to this, this, um, this sort of uncomfortable problem that we as people are surrounded by objects that we have no understanding of how they were made, how they were built, how they work. And I'm holding a pencil in my hand, and I mean, I you can even say to people, look at this pencil, and there's not a single one of you watching this who will be able to make something as simple as a pencil. Not a single one of you will understand how to mine the graphite that goes into this pencil, will understand how to grow the wood for the trees, understand how to, how, to, how to cut that wood, ship it around the world, combine it all into a pencil. And so objects as simple as this that we all take utterly for granted are part of this sort of cultural genome as a result of our technological change. And the objects that really surround us now, tablets and smartphones, no army of people even understands how they're made. I mean, companies like Samsung and Apple and, and NASA, the American and space agency have armies and armies and armies of people running their complex machines. No single individual has even a clue what a part, how a part of that machine works. Doesn't that make us very vulnerable then? If there's some breakdown in this connectivity, everything collapses. Well, yes, indeed. I mean, it, it's the case that when NASA goes to um, um, upgrade its computers, it does so very, very cautiously simply because the old computers that it's running, it knows that they're working reliably, but it knows that if it tries to move to a new computer system, there'll be errors and it won't know how to get rid of them. And so we all know that something as simple as a power outage now would render most of us sort of hopeless for days on end. So we really have become highly, highly dependent on this interconnected world because so few of us do understand how it works. Assuming that civilization continues to progress, I mean, where would you put us in 50 or 100 years time, speculate. Yes, well, I think, I think one of the fascinating things we can say is that it looks as if our cultural trajectory all over the world, now this is an uncomfortable thing to say, or people find it uncomfortable, but our cultural trajectory all over the world is the same. If you travel to Mumbai, Dubai, New York, Los Angeles, Beijing, all of these cities look the same. When you get up close, perhaps the street signs are in different languages. They all have skyscrapers, they all have street lights, they've all got traffic police, and so on. And what this tells us is that humanity is constantly using its technology to make its life simpler and more prosperous, more sanitary, more healthful. And we're doing this the same all over the world. At the moment, a million people a week are leaving the countryside and moving to cities. If we look at uh, to the future 50 or 100 years, we are going to live in a world that is full of cities with a few people in the countryside growing the food for the rest of us and maybe generating the electricity for the rest of us. That's where we're going. Thank you, Mark. That's absolutely fascinating. And our grandchildren will find out if you're right. Thanks very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you.